Welcome to the Draft Deeper Podcast. This is your host, Nathan Grubel. Joining me as always is my producer, Kevin Black, and my co-host, Cole Miller. Now, Cole, I, I'm pretty excited for this one. We got a good show here running through, starting to run through our first top 30 um, for, for the 2021 NBA Draft. We're going through one through five this time around. And I don't know about you, I'm really excited about this group of guys and, and how my first top five is shaking out. How are you feeling about your top five? Yeah, this this one through five is loaded. I think any year where you could realistically have one or two or three guys really fight for that top spot, the class is going to be looking pretty good um, come their rookie year. But I'm excited to dive into them right now, and I'm excited to keep watching how they develop for the rest of the college season or G League season for a couple of these guys. Absolutely. And for for everyone out there listening, you've heard me personally already talk about some of these guys, certainly three out of the five. I, I haven't touched any of the G League Ignite prospects yet, really because we, we don't have true film to go off of other than um, what they did in high school. We don't have any of that G League film. Now, the good news is is that the G League Ignite team is going to be fully present inside of the G League bubble they're going to be doing for their season, and they are going to be playoff eligible should they actually perform that well. They did announce that. So we should hopefully very soon – have enough film to be able to really go deeper on two of these five prospects. But I want to start at the top. Um, I I think this is a pretty safe consensus across the board, both um, talent evaluators on social media, scouts like ourselves, Cole, scouts in front offices. I think everyone pretty much has Cade Cunningham, um, the the wing slash guard out of Oklahoma State at number one. Um, just kind of give me a few of your thoughts, Cole, what you think about Cade Cunningham, what he's done through this first half of the season, and then I'll kind of get into some of my thoughts that I've had about him recently than, than what a few of my first takes were on a previous episode of the pod. Yeah, I mean, Cade just brings a, a nice blend of uh, nuance, resolve, calmness to his game. Uh, he can score, he can dish. He really just knows uh, how to get his team involved and when to get involved himself. Um, I love that he really looks to walk that line through every game, shows that he has an approach to each game. Um, so I like that a lot out of the number one pick. Shows me that he reads the game well. Uh, I think he needs to be a little bit more aggressive on offense. I think that's where I've kind of felt like he's left something to be desired in the early going of the season. Um, he has the ability at this level to score inside and outside. So I'd love to see him take apart mismatches a little bit more going forward. Um, I think defensively, he's fine. He'll compete and he'll get better and better. I think he'll be a great team defender because he's going to communicate. Uh, I think he's got a lot of natural leader in him, which is great out of the number one spot in the draft too. So he's just the total package. And I, you know, I just can't wait to see him keep refining his game. Uh, what do you think of uh, his early season performance so far? Yeah. So pretty much uh, across the board, he he's checking a ton of boxes, 18, six and four as, as a base stat line in terms of points per game, rebounds and assists. That, that's certainly a nice, line to be at if you are considered as the number one overall pick um and and for some of the the discrepancies i've had about his scoring repertoire his his efficiency and his percentages check out 46 percent from the field overall 37 percent from three 82 percent from the free throw line um the the three-point number is what's probably standing out to me the most as a, a positive addition to his game at least this far in college He's taking almost four threes a game, so being able to hit at that clip, that's certainly something nice to see. It's not like he's only taking one or two per game. He, he's actually been letting it fly more recently, especially. Um, I'd like to see him probably get to the free throw line a little more than just five attempts per game. If he's making about 82%, I think that would definitely bump his scoring numbers up and something that's probably going to be a focus um, as he gets to the NBA level, being able to draw fouls a lot more efficiency and definitely leverage his size, especially if he's going to be playing more of like the point guard position at the NBA, being able to leverage that size on smaller guys. And then when he does get into the trees, being able to effectively draw contact and and be able to score points in, in that respect. Um, but the main thing about Cade that really stands out to me is I, I'm not quite sure that he's like this takeover number one prospect in terms of like if you have a game on the line you're going to put the ball in his hands he, he's definitely going to go and, and get you that bucket that you need I'm not quite sure that he's that guy at least yet but 
how he is from quarter one through quarter four, just in terms of his versatility, he's like a mobile artillery unit, right? Like you can use him in, in so many different ways because of how he sees the game. As you mentioned, his basketball IQ is incredibly high. Um, you can have him with the ball in his hands. You can kind of move him off the ball around different parts of the court and different actions, and he can redirect the ball wherever it needs to go. He, he's pretty much going to make the right play, right? And yeah, he has about three and a half turnovers per game. A lot of those turnovers are really when he's asked to do too much trying to score the ball, right? When when his other guys are contributing around him and they're chipping in and converting shots off some of those bullet passes that he's throwing and whipping around across the court, his numbers look a lot better and those turnovers are down. Um, def- defensively is another area I talked about uh, on, on the previous podcast where I talked about some of these guys. That's really been encouraging to me and something I've been intrigued with studying because of his size, his length, kind of how he wants to play on defense is more of like a rover versus, versus like an isolation, um, like a one-on-one defender. I, I think he can really cause some problems creating turnovers, playing passing lanes. He's certainly smart and heads up enough to see some of those plays coming before they happen. So I'm really intrigued to see how he keeps developing defensively. He definitely rates out. It, it's ironic that I say that though, because by the numbers, he actually rates out better um, in, in, man, in man-to-man sets versus playing in a zone, which... I don't know. That intrigues me because I see him trying to be like this rover defender, but he actually rates out pretty well guarding guys one-on-one. What what are a few of the things that you've noticed from Cade def- defensively, Cole, that have stood out to you? Because I've been really intrigued to watch that. I think defensively, like I said, you know, in my spiel was that like he's, he's just going to be a, a good communicator. That's just who he is on the floor. So mm-hmm. uh, in, in team defense, I think at the NBA level, when you have more NBA level defenders playing with him, he's going to be able to show that rover uh, side of him that you think he is trying to show in college, but maybe not uh, quite able to just because his other defenders aren't as good as he is on the ball. Um, so I think his length at this level is definitely helping him contain his his uh, defender that's in front of him, and his length at the next level will continue to do that and also help him further off the ball when he's with better defenders. One one thing that did surprise me in, in, in sort of a negative light, we, we can talk about his, his one-on-one scoring package not being the most refined. I think that's definitely going to need some work as he goes to the NBA level. But being below average in transition offense, when, when you talk about Cole, when, when you first started off by saying you'd like to see him be a little more aggressive, that's one area where I would definitely like to see him be more aggressive. I feel like he he's not like a like a Lonzo Ball in terms of somebody that's always going to be hitting like the, the these massive hit ahead passes like from one end of the court down to the next. Um, I, I think he's a guy that would really benefit from pushing the pace more himself instead of trying to get the ball away quickly to somebody else and then kind of letting the half court offense come down because he is much more of a half court player right now but definitely being more effective in those transition opportunities when they have them pushing the pace himself maybe being a little more aggressive off the break kind of looking to to get somebody like a smaller matchup especially since more guards are playing him one-on-one getting one of those one-on-one matchups in transition in the open court and looking to score or draw foul in that way maybe that's another way that he can accentuate his offensive game at this level and then take that into the nba as well um, I talked about some of my concerns with his one-on-one scoring package. That's definitely the way to play Cade right now is putting size on him, right? Like right. One, one thing that Cade loves to do is he loves to get that smaller matchup one-on-one in the half court after he's created something or something else has created something for him. He likes to take those smaller guys into the post. He actually has a pretty decent um, hook shot in the post that he can go to when he has a smaller matchup on it, but you put size on him. He's not really the most explosive athlete. Now, granted, he has a pretty decent handle. He can, he can create for others off the dribble, but he's not the most refined at creating for himself. So he he's going to have a few struggles in the NBA when he gets there. I don't think he's going to be this quote unquote instant impact star in terms of like one-on-one play, but everything else that he brings to the table, I agree. He's, too safe of a package to not take at number one overall. Pretty much anything you can think of, any basketball-related skill that you can think of, he's shown an example, at least one example, that he can do it at this point through college. So I'm not really too worried about his overall skill set translating in different ways, and then eventually I think he is going to be a star that really pops to the next level. So I think you and I are pretty much in agreement on him. Another guy that we're in firm agreement, I would think, 
is, is Jalen Suggs. You and I both have him at number two. Um, now that number two race, I think is going to be pretty interesting once the G League Ignite guys have their chance to pop on some more film. But Suggs to me, the, the one thing I really gushed about Cole on a previous podcast is his leadership. I think he's probably the best natural born leader in this class. I, I read an article that was written by Jonathan Wasserman over at Bleacher Report where he's actually talked to some NBA scouts and they're comparing his leadership style and his effect on the court to that of like a Russell Wilson in the NFL. And I thought that was a pretty, that, that definitely opened my eyes, but at the same time, I can 100% see it. And that's something that I'm definitely buying into apart from some of his games. So Cole, at, at least basketball skill wise, why don't you break down some of what you like about Jalen Suggs? Sure. I actually, I hadn't read that article, but I actually love that comparison from a leadership standpoint. Uh, if, if you are a football fan and you remember Russell Wilson just starting out, he took over Seattle and it was just so clear from day one that he had this team in his hands and they were going to listen to him and do everything to win at his will. Uh, and I feel like we saw the same thing with Jalen Suggs from game one with Gonzaga this year, a freshman taking over a team like Gonzaga and from jump, they were playing his style and he, he knew exactly where to find his teammates. It was just like, wow, this team looks like they've been playing together for five years already. Um, so in terms of actual skill, he, he's just that prototypical point guard. He's fast. He's smart. He can run pick and roll. He's a demon in transition. I mean, what more could you want? It looks like he's improved his jump shooting, which was a big question coming into college. Uh, I think the sky is the limit for Jalen Suggs when it, when it comes to the NBA, and it's just a matter of natural progression for this kid. I really don't see too many flaws with this game, except maybe he's a little over-exuberant at times, but that's nitpicking. Well, that is that is probably one of the three flaws that, that I've really noticed about his game is that he does need to tone down the aggression a, a little bit. Now, he's gotten better at that as more of the season has progressed along. He, he's definitely let some of the other guys on the team have their standout moments, like a Corey Kisper, like a Joel Iai, like a Drew Timmy. Um, he, 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 his aggression has led to him getting in foul trouble on the defensive end, which, I, I mean, when, when he's on, when he's not being over-aggressive, He's one of the best defenders in the country, arguably the best guard defender in the country, period. You can certainly make that case for him. Um, so he that is an area that he needs to work on. The other would pro another one of the three would probably be his free throw shooting. He's only shooting about 66% from the line. So mechanically, I really don't think there's anything wrong with his stroke. That must be uh, more, more of a mental thing at this point, but I'm confident that that's going to come up because his shooting numbers everywhere else across the board are spectacular. Um, and, then, and then the third thing, it's really funny because he he pretty much is not lower than the 52nd percentile on any metric, on any synergy metric on offense. Defensively, the only place where he, he really struggles um, has been around the basket, which he's not the biggest of guards. I He's listed at 6'4". I'd probably eyeball him more of like a 6'3", like a maybe like a 6'2 and 3 quarters. That's where my eyeball test puts him. So he's not the biggest guy, but that's really it. Like if he's not going against the trees, if he's going up against other guards, he's going to have his way and he's going to make an impact on the game. So in some ways, I like to see him be just a tad more aggressive getting to the line on offense and figuring out how to draw fouls. I don't think he draws fouls really well. He likes to crash into the trees and be aggressive on his drives, but he doesn't really know the nuances yet of picking up contact and then getting to the line from there. He's only taken about three and a half free throws per game. So that's something I definitely like to see, but um, his assist numbers and assist to turnover ratio is perfectly fine. He's averaging 3.1 steals and blocks per game. Obviously his, his PER is up there around 27 um, shooting about 62% on his true shooting percentage. So I, I really don't have many complaints about Suggs. I think they're, if you're looking for a prospect that doesn't really have any weaknesses to his game, and you definitely need a leader in that backcourt, I, I think that he's probably the the guy that you go with, Cade being the safest number one. But I, I'm not ruling Jalen Suggs out of the number one argument as some of these other guys either. I, I think that Suggs has certainly proven that. He, he's playing with NBA caliber talent at Gonzaga and kind of showing us already what you can expect from him at the NBA level. Like I think he's one of two guys in this draft class that really has a chance to pop immediately as like a star caliber type guard going into the NBA. What do you think about that prospect, Cole? Yeah, no, I agree. I, uh, the couple little blemishes that you brought up, like the not being a good defender down low, even despite that, he, he makes some really high level help side plays where he comes in and swats somebody who's about to dunk it so he's not afraid to go in there and you know meet somebody at the rim at the very least which is mm -hmm. great to see 
Um, I saw this one highlight actually where Gonzaga was up 16 points against Iowa and he made a bad pass like right as they entered the half court and he raced back and beat the guy who stole the ball to the rim and jumped up and, and blocked it without a foul. And I was like, you know, that just shows you who, who, who this kid is. He's going to eliminate every mistake there is in his game. He's going to try and be, you know, the best version of him every time out. So I think if he works on those little wrinkles, uh, you know, trying to not crash into the trees, like you said, on his drives and, you know, trying to be more savvy with gaining contact and getting to the line, he'll figure that out and the game will, you know, just open up for him even more. And I think he will figure that out real soon. And so that's why, yeah, I think he makes the jump pretty quickly in the NBA. Yeah, and as you mentioned, though those those nuances in terms of like drawing contact in the correct way, drawing fouls to to get to the line more, those are things that you can learn from film, from from studying other players, talking with other players at the professional level, working with some coaches um, on on some drills to be able to do that more effectively. That's something that you can learn. Um, probably the the best example that I can give from from someone who learned more better how to do that i think james harden's kind of always had that as part of his game but i didn't see him bead really take advantage of any of that in college mainly because he was still like like, like a fresh spring chicken learning right. more about the game of basketball when he was at kansas but he's someone that has learned how to do that and and has improved leaps and bounds at getting into the free throw line of the nba now granted he's a big he, he has a much better physical advantage in terms of going up against big guys and it's it's easier to draw contact when you're of a certain size um, and, and like that nuanced style way versus being the small guy that has to go up against the trees and, and you're, you're potentially always have the threat of getting your shot blocked a lot easier than somebody like an Embiid. But that's just an example of somebody who certainly took that to a whole nother level yeah. and learned how to do that in the NBA. And that's only that's only going to suit Suggs more and, and help his numbers improve across the board. Yeah, we've we've already seen some spectacular moments from Suggs, especially as you mentioned on the defensive end. I've been I've been so impressed with him and I really liked him coming out of high school, as I mentioned on the other pod. Uh, but I didn't see this kind of a jump or, or this kind of play coming from him coming out of high school. And certainly a lot of other scouts had him um, as, as a lower half lottery guy on a lot of their boards like preseason. But man, has has he been absolutely fun to watch? And it, it it's not hard to sell me on someone who has high character. You and I both know that's that's a huge um, thing that I look for when I'm scouting and getting to know prospects is what kind of person are they? How hard is their work ethic? Are they willing to do everything that it takes to improve to get to that star level? And and Suggs Suggs really has it all. I'm not going to rule him out. Um, do, do, and your opinion, Cole? Since we've talked about our top two prospects on our board. Do you think Cade is definitely going to be number one when, when all is said and done? Or do you think that someone like Suggs um, ha has a case to be made for number one and that discussions should still be kept open? I think Suggs has a case right now. I think the separator in my mind right now, and, and I think Cade can play himself out of this still. Um, I think Cade just gives you like ultimate roster flexibility with his blend of skills and his size. And so I mm -hmm. think that means something. Um, Suggs is you know, a great point guard, but he is a one, and that's kind of it. So I think that's just a little bit of the separator for me when I, when I get to how elite these guys are in terms of everything else they do. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with everything you just said at this point. Um, that, that's our one to two ranking. Number three is, is where we would definitely have some differences. I think at least you and I would among general consensus. I think for the most part, a lot of people have firmly planted Evan Mobley at that third spot, we're going to get to him in a little bit, but our third guy on our, on our board is Jalen Green playing for the G League Ignite. And when, when I think about Jalen Green, I don't have a bunch of stats to throw out there. I don't have all the numbers. I don't have, like I said, a lot of that film to go off of, but just going back, watching a lot of what he did in high school, um, get, getting some film on some of the workouts and, and things he's been doing in some of the offseason periods before he got with the G League Ignite team. He and somebody else said this to me on Twitter too. He's he's the most box office prospect I think in this class. When when you're talking about star power, when you're talking about what this kid could be, a true six six, he could play the two or the three. He's he's a definite. I, I have him pigeonholed more as a guard because I think he's probably going to be more of like an off ball two guard secondary initiator in the NBA versus like playing up in position. But he can step up. He can he can guard threes. If he has to, he has the size, he has the length, he has the athleticism to do so. But offensively, when you talk about 
the shot makers in this class. I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Cole, I think he's far and away the best pure shot maker in this class. Like his mid-range game, when you when you talk about watching like a young Kobe Bryant, like I, I know it's th- th- that's a potentially blasphemous name to bring up when you're talking about comparing a guy to somebody or like throwing comparisons out there. But that's honest to God what he reminds me of is a young Kobe Bryant just in terms of the level of craft that he has in his shot making and his attention to detail in the fundamentals of how he's approaching a shot both from getting to a spot as well as his footwork once he's in a stance and then rising up and firing for a shot. Those things are really impressive to me and stand out and it's tough to find isolation heavy scorers at his age in a draft class like it, there, there's only so many of these guys that you can pick out every year that you know that like if you call on him to go get a bucket he can get that bucket and I think that's certainly what rose Jason Tatum up in his draft class that's why Danny Ainge w- was so anxious and eager to to draft him over some of the other guys that were at the top of that class because you just looked at Jason Tatum's polished skill set you looked at his triple threat game you knew that this guy was going to be a dangerous um, shot maker in the NBA, maybe not from like day one, but certainly by the end of his first year and then going into his second year, he absolutely was that guy. And then he just took off. So uh, what, are the, what are some of the things that impress you, um, Cole, regarding Jalen Green? Yeah, I mean, ever since I caught Jalen Green for the first time a few years ago, I felt the same way you did about the Kobe thing. Uh, I just feel like he embodies that Kobe perfectionism. And I, I I don't want people to misconstrue that for like him being a Jack, whereas that was maybe the concern on him. Like he doesn't read the offense or he doesn't read offense that well, or he's just concerned with himself. I don't think so. I think he's just ultra. He's just an ultra perfectionist and he's going to hone in his craft. Like you said to, you know, the highest level and he's going to score at will in the NBA. I don't think anybody is going to stop, stop this kid. Uh, I meant it when I told you off air this morning that, it takes two supreme talents to unseat this kid as number one. Uh, if he shows out in the G League Ignite team, I think I would be happy to rise him from three. Uh, I just think this kid has a world of talent, and I think he'll do. He'll end up doing everything that he'll play, make, he'll defend, he'll he'll do everything for a team. I think I don't think there's anything stopping this kid. I think he wants it all. I agree. I I think if he was playing in college right now and he had the exposure that Cunningham and Suggs did um, and Mobley for for that matter, I I think that Green would have a a strong case to to be the number one overall prospect on a board. I I don't think that's that's out of the realm. You brought up a great point about people thinking that he might be this this shot jack um, back back in high school. I, I think there, there's a difference when you talk about a Jack, right? And you and I have talked about this before, um, Cole, be, being around um, certain scouting rooms, talking to other scouts. You and I both know there's a difference between a guy who just has this supreme level talent to the mm-hmm. point where he just always finds himself with the ball in his hands, and, and that's just what he does, right? It just comes naturally to him. Then there's this other type of player who actually is a Jack who thinks that he has this mindset that he just thinks he's so much better than everyone else on his team that he feels like he has to take this shot and he's just going to just jack up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven shots in a row, right? There's a difference between those two players. And I think Green falls into the former category than the latter. I think you and I are definitely in agreement on that. So that's going to be one of the things that that definitely pushes his case as far as rising up the board is when we see him in more of these G League Ignite games Does he find more of his opportunities within the flow of the offense? Is he able to create some of those shots efficiently? Or is he just going to try to go up against like two or three guys at a time, just try and force things on offense and not necessarily let some of those other guys play through what he can do and in turn he could play um, through them. So that's definitely going to be something to to watch. Um, As as far as – oh, go ahead, Cole. I, I think that's the big thing to watch. And I almost came off like feeling speechless just now on my first take on him. That's just how enamored I am with this kid when I watch him from his high school and, and the workout stuff that he has done this summer. His body control is insane. Uh, and like he just has the – when I on our last podcast, I kind of said how Anthony Edwards doesn't have the correct athleticism for a two-guard. Well, that's entirely the opposite case for Jalen Green. I think this is exactly what you want for a two-guard with who's got the supreme athleticism. Um, I'm, I'm, I really am just blown away with this kid. I think there's no flaw with him offensively. 
Oh, J- Jalen Green and Anthony Edwards. Yeah, I they're they're in two different they're in two different universes. Um, I know that Anthony Edwards has already had some some good games for the Minnesota Timberwolves as far as scoring the basketball. Um, props to him. We you and I have pointed out that he certainly has a lot of work to do on on both ends of the floor, just understanding the game at a deeper level and then letting that translate out through the rest of his talent. Um, but yeah, I don't think that Jalen Green's going to have any of those concerns as far as being able to process the game at a high enough level and understand what he needs to do on both ends of the floor. I really don't have a ton to say about him defensively right now. I, I talked a little bit about my thoughts, but we're really going to get to talk about him more defensively once the G League and Night team starts playing some games. So I, I can't wait to dive deeper into that um, and, and see just how far he can climb even from, from number three. I, I, I think that there, there is, if I had to give it like a percentage chance, I think there's, there's at least a 35 to 40% chance that we might have him number one in this class overall above Cade when it's all said and done, just because of the pure talent and, and box office that he brings to the table, right? Like let's, say, let's say, for example, Cole, and you and I were just talking about this off the air, kind of thinking about teams that, that might benefit from having these guys on their roster next year. If the New York Knicks, say, for example, they get the number one overall pick, right? I, I think they're going to take Jalen Green. I, I don't think they'd still take Cade Cunningham. That's just kind of my opinion. I think New York is, has been thirsty for that star, for that box office star, that, that elite athlete for, for quite some time. They had Carmelo Anthony, but he wasn't on the athletic level that this kid is. Like Jalen Green is one of the top shelf athletes in this class. If the New York Knicks had the number one pick in your opinion, Cole, are, are you kind of aligned with that? Do you think they'd go the green route? Or do you think that they would still kind of want to play it safe, safe and, and take Cunningham? I think for them it would be between, be between Suggs and Green. Uh, I think – both of them are like Suggs is pretty box office himself, and I think he will be in the NBA as well. With mm-hmm. you know playing with a uh, full squad of NBA athletes, um, but yeah, I don't think Cade would be top on their board. He's a little too relaxed for New York, and that can work in New York. But I think you have to be yeah, you really have to know the type of guy if they're relaxed. You know if their demeanor is naturally relaxed to succeed in New York. And I don't have you know the inside link to who Cade Cunningham is right down to the core, so. Uh, just from my perspective, I would say Suggs and Green would be at top of their board, and I would probably go Green. But they haven't had any success drafting point guards within the last five years, so maybe they <laughs> they want to button that up and just take Suggs. Yeah, and and that wouldn't be a bad pick for for them either. I'm glad you you brought him up um, from from the Knicks perspective because I think that that that's one thing other than Thibodeau. I'm not quite sure who the the born leader is on that team. I guess right now it's Randall. He's playing at such an all-star level. He's certainly putting up the numbers to be an all-star this year, and the team's actually having some success. But I'm not quite sure that that Jalen Suggs wouldn't be a better leader than Randall right out the gate. And and I think if, if you're just looking for somebody to, to be able to bring people together, make everyone around him better, while also still being like a little bit of a scoring dynamo himself. And and we, we talked about, too, um, and uh, at different times off the air that you don't necessarily need a point guard defensively who's like this lockdown guy, right? Like the point guard probably is going to be the weakest spot on your defense, but you need somebody at the top who's at least going to set the tone, right? And right. Jalen Suggs from from start to finish is, is going to keep that tone as high intensity. You know, we're coming out here. We're going to beat this other team. We're going to guard the hell out of them tonight. And that's just going to be our mindset from from game one to game 82. So I think if, if that's what New York is looking for, then I that that's why you can't count Jalen Suggs out of the number one conversation. But if you're just looking for this box office type, pure talent who is going to sell tickets at the Garden, Jalen Green is the guy who who you're going to go with. Uh, so I, I, I'm glad that that's kind of where we've settled on that conversation. Now, you and I do differ here at the four and five spots on our board, um, Cole, you have Jonathan Kuminga, number four, and then you have Evan Mobley, number five. I have the reverse. So I'd actually like to start with Jonathan Kuminga, Cole. Um, what do you see about his game that definitely stands out to you and things that you think will translate early on in an NBA career? Because he's kind of the one guy out of this top five that I can't say I have definitely the best feel on i think i have a better feel for for jalen green and what he did in high school than what i feel that kuminga did out of high school 
Yeah, I, I can't argue with that. And I agree, Kaminga's guy definitely have the least feel on. And I think everybody is missing uh, the most in terms of evaluation with the lack of film this season so far. Um, but I think what we do know and what I'm about to say is pretty well known is that he has two-way monster potential um, at 6'8 and the measurables that he also uh, possesses. So I think based off that and his age and what little skills he has shown throughout high school, it's not like his shot is completely broken. He's made jumpers, mm. plenty of them. Uh, I think there's a lot to work with. And I think, honestly, not going to school and just getting this time to refine his game is actually pretty good. He'd be more athletic than most people in college. And I think it, it might honestly cause him to uh, fall into bad habits, depending on where he would have ended up at school, uh, just trying to coast on athleticism versus weaker opponents and whatnot. So I think getting into like this pro-level training at his age, again, he's the youngest player in the draft. We talked about last pod how Moses Moody was really young, but Kaminga's even younger uh, by a few months. Yeah, he reclassified up. Yeah, Right. So that's, that's scary um, to me. I think with that in mind and the canvas of uh, physical tools and skill that he's already shown i think i think he gets to be over mobley for me uh and i think that's because mobley and we'll get into it a little bit more but my reason for putting him over mobley is that i just don't think mobley's ready to be any kind of post presence yet uh in the nba tomorrow if you had to classify or, or try to classify a, a position for kuminga cole would you have him more as like a like a three four or a 4-3, because some of the film that I've actually been able to get into with Kuminga, I think he actually will end up fashioning himself more a as a 4, looking for other 3s to kind of mismatch against offensively. Because I've actually seen, well, one of the things that's stood out to me the most about Kuminga is he, he has a pretty decent post game, and he has a pretty decent fallaway jump shot out of the post. And I think that's an aspect that as an NBA team, when, when you're talking about some of these guys coming in, what can they do really well to earn themselves minutes and earn themselves touches and shots right away? I think that's an aspect of Kuminga's game that if you're, if you, if you draft him, right. And you play him with another big who can space the floor and you kind of have Kuminga doing a little bit of offense from the post and getting touches that way, I think that could be a strength and a benefit to him early on versus having him more pigeonholed as like a three, four and having him try to spread the floor where I'm not as confident in his jump shot, but I am really confident um, about some of the things he can do inside the arc. So how would you kind of classify him from, from that perspective today? I think you make a great point there. Um, kind of laying out what his best path early on to uh, playing time would be in the NBA. I, I would say four, three would definitely be the way to go for him just because the jump shot might be a little erratic in the early going. Um, but yeah, I'll bring up his age here. He might grow another inch or two. Um, but also, even if he doesn't, he has extreme athleticism to make up for any lack of size at the four spot that might happen on any given night. So I think between his length and athleticism, yeah, you could easily play this guy at the four um, and then switch him up as lineups dictate to the three and, his, uh, and as his outside game continues to develop. Yeah, and, and just from, from a strength perspective, too, we talk about how young he right. is, but he has a body on him. Like, yeah. if just a little spoiler alert for everybody listening out there, um, he, he's probably one of the top three guys in my top 10 in terms of strength. I'll just throw out some other names that we'll be talking about on the next podcast, but up there with like a Jalen Johnson and a Scotty Barnes, like Kuminga has a body on him. I think that those are the kind of guys he compares to from a physical perspective right now in this class. And that's a huge plus for somebody who is as young as you point out and is only going to take more time to further refine his body, grow into his frame more, and then kind of develop more of his outside skill set from there. Um, I, I'm not confident, at least right now, in a lot of his shot making ability off the dribble I, I i think from from what i've seen in some of the film and, and some of the highlights that that we've been able to to get witness of from these g league scrimmages I, I don't think that he's going to hit some of those same shots that he's gotten off and and been fortunate enough to make in those scrimmages right away at the nba level but it is something that i think he will be able to do over time and he's probably out of these top five guys i don't know where you sit on this Cole, I know you have him ranked ahead of Mobley. I think Kuminga's probably the one guy who's might need the most seasoning 
out of these five guys. But at the same time, I don't necessarily let that, I know you don't let that affect where you grade them and where you would take them. I think that's only a positive to where he is and how much talent he's already flashed at this point compared to some of these other guys. No. And that thing can, ha- the seasoning can happen quickly. If the guy, you know, if the, you know, if it just, the guy has the right makeup and whatnot, I think early in Isaac Okoro was freshman year, we, we kind of felt maybe he didn't have the ability to impact the NBA level right away, but he's proven or over the course of the season, he changed that narrative and he's obviously proven, proven the narrative uh, correct to be changed uh, in his early going of rookie year. So yeah, I, I think with Kaminga, it's just a matter of getting in game reps at this point. And he's just that level of athlete. Um, and then we need to see based off how those reps, you know, where to rank them off that, but he's got all the tools in the world. And um, again, I just think that I'll go to, I'll go to this point. The NBA has always been a wing game. Uh, <laughs> So if he clicks, he's a monster of a wing. Oh, if he ends up being like a, a supreme 3-4 talent versus the 4-3, um, yeah, you're talking about a completely different ceiling for him. I'd probably put him in more of the 4-3 category, not just the start. I think that's eventually probably what he's just going to to play more naturally. But yeah, if that wing that wing package of skills really takes off, I agree. He has He has one of the highest ceilings in this class for sure. Um, Probably close to the height of the ceiling that Jalen Green has. Like I think Green probably has the highest ceiling out of these five guys. I'm not sure that his floor is as high um, as somebody like a Cunningham or a Suggs, just based on the fact that we could potentially be wrong about where we're classifying him as, as a shot taker in terms Mm -hmm. of a guy who wants to operate within the offense versus being more of a Jack. I don't see Suggs or Cunningham being that kind of a problem. And I don't see Kuminga being that much of a problem either. I think probably the, the biggest knock on him coming out of high school was that he's one of those guys that could be seen as being too passive and, and he can disappear within the flow of the offense, similar to, to how you see like an Andrew Wiggins disappear within the flow of an offense. Like Kuminga is another one of those guys that can probably get a shot up almost whenever he wants in, in the vein of like a Wiggins but you don't always see Wiggins taking over games or looking for other ways to score unless he has the ball passed to him. So that's right. probably going to be one of the main things we're going to be looking at Kuminga um, once we get some of that G League tape moving forward. But um, this this leads to Evan Mobley, the last guy that we need to talk about here out of this top five. Now, I have him four, and I think you and I pretty much agree, at least we've agreed off the air, that the biggest thing holding him back is probably his body, um, his, his, his length, his, his, his lack, excuse me, um, of base strength. Uh, he, he can't really back anybody down. He could get back down. I don't really envision him as, as being this post-up player. I think he has to be developed as a face-up or a stretch forward. Now, the good news is, is that he's actually been pretty decent in that stretch forward face-up role. Um, he's shooting 42.9% from the three-point line. He's only taking a little over one a game, but in the shots that he has taken, you can see that the stroke is there. Mechanically, I have absolutely no problems with his with his shooting stroke. Um, he does need to get better from the free throw line. That might be an indicator towards that he's not going to be ready to shoot threes quite yet once he gets to the NBA, but certainly stepping out um, play, playing off those elbows, taking elbow, like jump shots from the elbows. I think he's going to be perfectly fine at knocking some of those down once he gets to the NBA level. He is a competitive rebounder. He does try to fight where he can on the glass, but he's not this physically imposing talent for his seven-foot size that I think you and I would ultimately like him to be, and that's definitely what holds him back a little bit. Um, so why don't you get into some of those concerns, Cole, cause you're a lot better of a body doctor than I am, um, in terms of where you see his, his upside as maybe like a four or a five. Yeah. So I, I think we pretty much agreed down the, right down the middle on what we, how we see him entering the league is his lack of strength and physicality won't allow him to really have much of a back to the basket game in the early going. And to be honest, I don't even know if you want him be doing that. I think it's much, he's much more interesting on the perimeter, being able to utilize his jump shot and space the floor, uh, being a role guy who fades the screen for pops and dives because he's so mobile. Uh, you know, I think that's going to be where he really breads his butter. Uh, and he's also to hit. He's also able to hit 
uh, shooters in the opposite corner off those dives, which is really mm-hmm. impressive. He's got great touch on, on cross court passes already. And at his size, he's going to be able to make every single one of them. Um, so I, I don't want people to think like me having Evan Mobley at five is a slight. He's got great talent offensively. Um, I think he's going to be able to play the five, but I think he needs uh, on defense, but I think he does need a bigger bodied four uh, always next to him uh, just so he can, you know, have that frontline presence and doesn't always have to bang. He's, he's slender like Gobert, but I don't think he's, he's just small. He's not as big as Gobert. Rudy's just huge. Um, so I don't think he'll ever be able to, you know, bang with fives constantly for a game. And that's the thing. Like, I don't see his body filling out like, like Gobert's did. Like Gobert has a, a, a he, he's more slender in his overall frame. Yes. But his shoulder base is definitely wider and he certainly has wider hips. Um, than Evan Mobley has. Like, Evan Mobley is is literally just like, kind of like a straight line down. So I don't really see him filling out like that. That That is the big problem. And the numbers are certainly bearing the fact that he should be more of this, like, face-up kind of operating um, out of the high post and in, in areas like that. Um, he, he's poor um, rated in synergies, poor on post-ups, and, and only average. This really stood out to me as well. He's averaging in transition. So for every for, for all of the points that everyone wants to make about him on social media, that he's this like really gifted athlete um, with, with like all of this like grace and speed for a seven-footer, I personally really don't see that stand out to me on the film, and the numbers are actually backing up what I think about that. He's in the 34th percentile in transition offense, and you and I have, have talked about that we don't want him posting up. He's in the 12th percentile on offense on post-ups. That, wow. that has to be concerning for any kind of 7 footer you're looking at taking in the draft, that that's really not going to be a part of his game. And that if some of those jump shots aren't falling or he's, he has a matchup on him, somebody like a, like a stretch power forward who is like a really good defender, let's say somebody like a Jeremy Grant, right? Somebody who's not that far away from him in terms of height. So somebody that's going to hound him on defense. And if Evan Mobley is not seeing um, some of those passes, some of those cross-court passes or some of those looks that you're talking about, and he can't back somebody down in the post, I mean, he, he's got to give the ball up right away or it's potentially a turnover. So that's, that, that is concerning to me. I, I, don't, I don't really care what anybody else says. That is concerning to me, given the fact that his size, he should be able to back somebody down at least a little bit. Um, and, and also some of the defensive numbers one-on-one, he's only average in man sets. He's a lot better um, as more of like a roving defender in zones, which you can see from his three blocks per game. Um, he, that, that's certainly a big part of what he brings to the table, like a weak side shot blocker, somebody who can definitely help at certain times um, on, on defense and protecting the rim. So I, I've said this multiple times. I really think that his best chance for success is to like, I'm not saying that he's going to end up being Anthony Davis. I don't think he can be because of his body, but that sort of like development track, I think that's who you want him like watching film of the most out of any NBA guy that we could be looking at. Who, who, who could you maybe compare him to, or like who's a guy that you would set like a developmental path for uh, moving forward for Mobley Cole? Um, yeah. I mean, I agree with you on the Anthony Davis, but I, I can't get the name Channing Fry out of my head I mean I feel like that's kind of what if it doesn't go right for Mobley like that's kind of what he's reduced to but he'll definitely be a better playmaker than Channing Fry like I think Mobley can have the ball in his hands within the offense I, I think he'll be able to prove that at the next level so sort of like a Channing Fry plus um I don't know what that looks like if that ever, or, already came through the NBA or not um but just to, to go back to one of your concerns about him not being able to back anybody down, like the USC or the Pac-12 competition is, is not that great this year either. Like uh, if we're talking about Arizona State being the best team in the conference, potentially it's that's just a weak year for the for the conference. Um, and so that you have to consider that for Mobley too. He's not really going against NBA frontline guys every night right now. Um, and if he is, his brother's kind of taking that matchup. And he's disappeared already against some some of the better front lines that he's right. faced in college. Like you talk about Arizona state. Yeah. They're the best put together team or one of the best put together teams that he's probably going to face. And he had, we're, we're recording this on, on Sunday, January 10th. He had a really good game against them last night, putting up 19 points and 13 rebounds. But at the same time, they weren't playing a true big in that game. So he better have dominated against right. the front line that doesn't compare to him in terms of size and, and, and overall athletic ability. So in, in those matchups, it's like, yeah, great. He put up like a 19 and 13 game, but at the same time for somebody 
with, with his stature and his pedigree, he better be doing that or else that's really going to throw up a major red flag. It's one thing if he struggles against like this true seven footer who's been around like a junior or senior in college, somebody who's been around the block, somebody who's not going to get pushed around and in turn is going to push Mobley around. That's one thing because Mobley's a young frosh. But it's another thing for him to not dominate against much smaller front lines. So at the very least, we are seeing him put forth enough effort and, and, and talent and skill to be able to do that. So that's a positive. But I agree about all the concerns that, that you and I have brought up. Um, just being able to say that I can put somebody on like an Anthony Davis type developmental plan and he's, he's not going to be like timid to, to go after something like that. Like you, you can put him on that developmental plan and there's likely going to be more positive results ahead for him at the end of the tunnel. Like just being able to say that I think is a major positive of why I have him at number four right now. Totally. But the, the, the Channing Fry plus floor is concerning and that does give me a little bit of cause to pause in terms of having him at number four maybe not having somebody like Kuminga ahead of him which that could very well happen like you and I could get the film on these G League Ignite guys and I could absolutely see myself flipping those two should Kuminga definitely show out as much as Jalen Green in some of these games so that's going to be something that's worth exploring down the road and I, I won't rule anything out with these guys. I think you and I both agree, Cole, that a, a, a lot of this draft class is still very fluid. This isn't like last year where I think you could have arrived to conclusions about a lot of these guys a lot quicker because there wasn't as great of a talent crop at the top. But when we talk about like a top 10, a top 15 class, as, as we're going to be talking about more of these guys on our big boards through the coming weeks, there's so much more talent at the top of this class that it's really hard to rank these guys. Like when I was sitting here, even just doing this top five, I was back and forth about a lot. And I quite literally just made the move, moving Jalen Green ahead of Evan Mobley um, today. I literally made that move today because I was just going back through more of the Jalen Green film prepping for this pod. And I was like, I cannot have this guy lower than yeah. number three. He's just too good of a shot maker. So what, what's kind of been your overall thought process going over this top five and, and ranking these guys as we, as we close out this um, first edition of the big board podcast. I'm right there with you. It's, it's just been with this top five, uh, you know, is, is Suggs one right now or is two, especially coming off Cade's, you know, lackluster performance last night or the day before. Um, and uh, just battles all over the place. And even I think the, I think the top five isn't solidified yet. And I think, uh, you know, Kaminga or Mobley could be the, the guy to slide. I think the top three, for me at least, Suggs, Cunningham, and, and Green. I think those guys are pretty much going to be the, the three, unless there's a really big showing out of Kaminga or something like that. But, yeah, man, it, it's an exciting class. And like you said, we're going to keep learning about these guys. And it's it's going to be fun to discuss the next five. And I look forward to it. Absolutely. So for everybody out there listening, as we've alluded to enough, our next pod is going to be six through 10 on our respective big boards. We're going to keep our, our big boards separate for now. At some point, we may go to more of a composite board, but I will be sure to have both my top five rankings as well as Cole's top five rankings available for everybody to see on social media. So certainly look out for some of those tweets or Facebook posts. Follow us on both platforms. Um, and and we, we would love to see some of the discourse back and forth as far as where you might have some of these guys or if you have somebody else who we didn't even feature in our top five up there with some of these other names. We would love to know about it. We'd love to have that conversation with you. That's one of the reasons why we're doing this podcast, why we're on the platform that we are. So um, again, follow us on those platforms. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Um, definitely keep an eye out for, for more things to come, but this podcast was a lot of fun and it's only going to get better from here on out. So Cole, any other thoughts before we close out? No, that, that's it for me. Um, I guess I want a little food for thought for everybody. We've talked about a few of these guys not having a great free throw stroke. I almost wonder if guys are more concerned with getting their three point, three point stroke down before their free throw stroke down at this point in uh, the NBA and how things are, are valued. So I don't know. I feel like you and I could have a whole podcast just talking about um, developmental missteps that a lot of these guys are either taking themselves or are being forced to take because of how the developmental programs exist 
in, in our country at basketball now, right? Like with this right. up and down rise in AAU culture, not necessarily focusing on the fundamentals as much. I mean, we, we, we mentioned Kobe Bryant already on this podcast, rest in peace, but um, one of the big things that he talked about before his passing was that he would like to see basketball in the United States, youth basketball, get back to more of the fundamental education like they have in Europe. That that was one big thing that he talked about. So um, we, we could do a whole podcast about that. But I, I, yes. I agree. I agree. The, the, the obsessive nature of outside shooting, developing your three-point shot, working on these ridiculous step back shots or, or, or shout out to Chris Vernon um, and Kevin O'Connor at the ringer NBA show and on the mismatch podcast. Um, Chris Vernon literally called these step back shots crap backs because of yeah. the, the, the poor nature in which they're being taken at this point. And I agree. Like it's one thing if you're like a Luka Doncic or a James Harden, where you're so much of an advanced shot maker that you're kind of just looking to perfect like the next shot. And that's like next on your shot making bucket list versus some of these other guys that haven't even mastered just like your standard, like one, two dribble pull up inside the arc. And then you're talking about them instead of moving towards the basket, moving away from the basket and trying to knock down a much more difficult shot. So like, I, I, I agree with Chris Vernon, like some, some of this, some of this stuff in the NBA is getting a little bit out of hand. I agree. You got to crawl before you walk. Absolutely. Fundamentals, baby. Fundamentals. Well, that that's going to do it for us here. So thank you everyone out there again for listening. Uh, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Can't wait to see you on the next one.